Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We're really excited for today's session on preparing for autonomous vehicle technology. And I'd like to introduce our speaker, Marie France Lauren. Uh, she's the Director of Business Development at Stantec Generation AV. So I'll let her go ahead and get started. Thank you so much, Shelby, for having me today. I'm really, really excited to be here. Um, I'm going to go through a quick presentation just to give you a little bit of slides. Uh, full disclaimer, I apologize if you hear the dog barking in the back. That's uh, the big puppy here who's making some noise, he wants to say hi to everyone. Um, so on the presentation, I'll go through some quick slides. I would like you to interrupt me if you have any questions. Yes, I know it's strange to say that, but I'm not looking to do a full, um, a full monologue. I'm really looking to have conversation with all of you. So please feel free to interrupt me at any point and uh, jump in with the question that you have. So I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, please let me know if you don't see my screen, but I think you should see it right now. So we'll go quickly to what Generation AV is, just to give you um, a little bit of insight of what we do and what we um, work on. And then um, I'll move on to more of an explanation on what AV, AVs are and what type of AV we are working with. So when it comes down to uh, autonomous, um, to Generation AV, just so you know, it's, um, it's an innovation business opportunity that Stentec has invested in. We uh, were created about a year ago now. We were officially launched uh, in November. And Generation Navy is a combination of 12 people that are experts in the uh, autonomous vehicle industry. I personally have been working for the last six years in AVs uh, on deployment with different constructors um, on the policy side and also on the research side for governments um, uh, everywhere in North America. Corey, who's the founder of Generation AV, has over 12 years of experience in AVs. He worked in the military on the autonomous uh, vehicle projects that the um, Department of Defense had and uh, has been really um, a key player in the AV industry for everything deployment and making sure that all the, the steps and the hoops and loops have been addressed when it comes down to making that happen. So just want to... Get a kind of an overview of what uh, AVs are. Uh, I know that on top of your head, when you think of AVs, a lot of people will think of the autonomous vehicle, uh, autonomous snow speed shuttle that you might have seen in the news. Uh, we're thinking of the three big major players, which are Easy Miles, Navia, and Ali or Local Motors. Um, those vehicles are usually used for a first mile, last mile option or just for uh, connectivity within a community. Those vehicles are not the only one, and that's why uh, my presentation will focus on all the other different aspects of AVs. So when we think of the low-speed autonomous vehicle, we think of the people mover. Um, it could also be like right now we're talking about low-speed shuttle, but we all heard about the project in Connecticut with new flyers with a full-size bus that should be um, fully AV in, um, as the deployment is going on. But there's also um, the good mover, the good mover. So you're probably thinking about Amazon at this point and all of the drone delivery that they are working on. But there's so many other options uh, and so many other sectors that could benefit for goods moving uh, with AV solution. Think of airports, ports, uh, think of campus, community delivery. So it's really not just for the Amazon of the world, but it's also for other purposes where you can uh, minimize the traffic on the road and really optimize the delivery in an efficient way, but also to increase the customer experience. The low speed autonomous vehicle right now, as I mentioned earlier, is uh, used as a first mile, last mile connector. Um, it could have between 12 and 16 people on board and it goes really, really slow. So those are really just to facilitate um, the access to different um, mobility hubs, but they're not, they're not so much of a mobility solution by itself. It's really to connect um, those heavier type of uh, mobility solution. The middle mile connector is really what we think between the big warehouse and um, the delivery hubs. 
when you think of companies like UPS, FedEx, um, they all have to connect it to the, the people that will receive the delivery. Um, there's right now, there's a big movement when it comes down to truck. They're not fully autonomous trucks, but they're platooning option. So platooning option is really when you have the first truck that is being driven by someone, but then you have followers, uh, trucks that are following the first one um, that have nobody on board, or they can have an operator there, but the intent is to have nobody on board to really facilitate having one person that can drive more than one car at the same time. Um, when we think of that, I know a lot of people think of like, how, why do we want to do that? Why do we want to replace jobs with robots or with technology that will actually have those um, those options of, um, of robots? And what we think um, what we think of that is that the driving industry itself has really a lot of challenges right now to recruit people. So if that can help uh, goods from moving by having that technology uh, integrated in the, in the chain, in the delivery chain, that is uh, a good way to optimize uh, the movement of goods. Again, do not hesitate if you have any question or any burning elements that you want to have a question, uh, an answer on, please feel free to ask. Um, so there's many other um, solutions that are um, available for deliveries. Just want to show you there, we have that van on top here. So that van is used in some of the project that we have, which is delivery of groceries. So again, it's about um, facilitating the accessibility of everyone to food and to fresh food. So having a delivery that could be done like that for um, um, community that are a little bit more remote, um, that, that could be super helpful. Those little bots here, or really um, delivery, sidewalk robot delivery that are being used and tested right now with some of the, uh, let's say a restaurant. So you place your order and the restaurant gets it delivered with that little robot, cute little robots there. Um, the one in the middle, it's really the, the, the connectivity when it comes down to public transit. And the last one, there are the little robot that are being used as an example in some of the uh, warehouses. Uh, Amazon is using something like that. So instead of having people going to pick up um, the material or the goods in the shelf, it's actually the shelf that is being picked up by those little robots. They look like a little Roomba. If you guys are like me and had a Roomba, I bought mine 13 years ago and it's still up and running to clean my floor, but those little, those little pod thing, they go, they lift a little bit and they pick up the, the shelving uh, unit and they just move it to um, the, uh, the packers to prepare the orders. So instead of having people to move, it's the shelves that are moving to the people. Any question at this point? I'm sure you have. <laughs> okay, I'll continue. What environment can benefit from AV? So when you think of uh, AV solution, a lot of people think about uh, transportation in general and good transportation, but let's, let's get it wider than that. What I put in those next slides are just an example. It's not an exhaustive list of different solutions. It's really just to trigger ideas and to have a conversation with people that are uh, evolving in those uh, sectors and see how we can uh, provide insight and solution that are a little bit outside the box. When it comes down to AV, there's not really a limit of what AV can do. It's really just about the limit that you put to your own creativity that will put the limit in the projects that we can do. So at airports, when we think of AVs at airports, a lot of people will think, again, the low-speed autonomous vehicle shuttle that could bring people from the parking and bring them to the terminal. But there's so much more than that. What about uh, a, um, a robotic passenger information that goes within the airport? So instead of having those screen, you have those little robot that you can call maybe from a phone and the robot comes to you and you can ask all the question you need uh, and really interact with that robot to get all the answers that you need uh, on the delay, on when the onboarding will start, uh, what are the priorities for the onboarding and so on and so forth. But it's just like, you have questions, sometimes it's hard, sometimes it's hard to find people in the airport to answer your question, but you can have a, a robot that could do that with you. Uh, what about the robotic trolley collection? Now, we all know at the airport that there's trolley everywhere. 
What about having a little robot that just go, goes and do that? Um, the runway inspection, uh, one of the biggest budget expense, if one of the biggest expense in the budget of the airport, sorry about that, is the runway inspection, making sure that the runway is impeccable. So why about doing a drone that could do that when the planes are not in the air at that time? So it's way easier than having, uh, let's say, a car that is driven by a human that goes on top of the tarmac and make sure that everything is, um, is in good condition. You can have a drone that does that and it takes less time, less energy, and you have real-time data. Um, what about autonomous snowplow? So for those people that are lucky and live in the south of um, uh, North America, you might not be worried about the snowplow. But I know that I'm in Canada, and if you think of the airport in Edmonton, Winnipeg, Montreal, we all need to have snowplow there. So what about using a bigger snowplow that could be autonomous and really clean the tarmac or the runway uh, in a really efficient way? So I'm not gonna go through all those examples, but the idea is really to say like, think outside the box and see what you could do. When it comes down to community, uh, for a community and inspection drone for the community, the robo, ta the robo taxi, streets car, uh, autonomous street sweeper, those are all elements. And again, the objective is not at this point to take over and to remove everyone uh, from their job because we're going to use robot to do all that. This is absolutely not the intent. We're not there and it's not what we're aiming to do. It's really to see where we have um, difficulties to recruit the workers to do those kind of job and to maximize how we can do it. Um, I'll give you an example in the community. I worked on a project that is not so much AV, but it could eventually turn into AV. But you have people in the cities that are picking up the city garbage. So not the, my garbage at my house, but the garbage in the park or at the bus stop. And those, the way it used to be done and the way it's still being done in 99% of the cities right now is that you have a schedule. You are the employee of the city. You have a schedule and on Monday, that's the route you have to do and empty all those garbages. Tuesday, you have another route and Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. But what about having just like a, a little detector in those garbage that tells you when they're full so you don't have a route done on empty garbage? So the idea, again, is not to replace a person who's doing that, but it's that that person can be repurposed to other. We all have so much things to do. Cities and communities have so many things that they need to accomplish. So it's just about putting the right resource at the right place when it really makes sense and let the the, the more boring and the more challenging position to fill to be done by those uh, kind of solutions. AVs in uh, event venues. We all experience at one point or another in our life going to a baseball game or um, a football game. Then you have to leave before the end because you know that if you wait until the end, you'll be stuck in traffic for an hour. So what about increasing the, uh, the experience by having an AV that comes and picks you up. So you will have dedicated lane facility to get out of the, of the venue and, and really just creating an experience that makes sense. We all paid um, a lot of dollars to get to those sports or a special event. Let's just enjoy, enjoy them until the end. Because also we all know that the one game that you go to and you decide to leave before the end, it's in the last five minutes that everything is being decided and your team lose. So let, let's not be that kind of person. Uh, in the ports, we know that ports are already um, fully or really advanced in, in AV technology when it comes down to um, taking the load out of the boats and moving it in the port. But what about creating um, really a, a synergies between the operation of the port itself and the logistic that has to get out of the port? So the trucking, the train that are coming to pick up, like just to autom um, make sure that we can automate everything around it to make it as efficient as possible. Question. I would like to call someone out. I, I don't see anyone on the screen. All I see is names. I really want to make sure that everyone is there and listening. <laughs> it looks like we have one question in the chat here from Krish. Sure. 
They said, uh, what are your thoughts on how maintenance on AVs will be done slash performed? Are fleet operators ready to support without an operator? Uh, I'm just gonna try to get the question. Um, so fleet, fleet operator right now um, are, are working to get that maintenance. So we're talking about the operator. The operator right now is somebody that is in the vehicle uh, almost at all time, um, just to get a kind of, um, it's kind of a redundancy for the safety that is required by the policymaker right now, because nobody is ready to just have those vehicles going loose. So we need to learn, do the baby steps before we start running. So we have those people in the vehicle and they are there in case there's something that goes wrong. Uh, most of the time on all the deployment that I did, those people were just there to welcome the people on board and tell them a little bit more about what AVs are and how they're working and the different, like people have a lot of questions, like how does the system work? Like, is there a camera somewhere? Uh, what does that, what happened if there's a squirrel that just crossed the street? Like those kind of questions. So, Literally, the operators are there for that at this point. Um, when it comes down to big operation um, companies, so, so I worked for a private operator for years, and what we were doing is really just like overlooking the management of the fleet itself. So right now, what we're doing is really having like one AV deployment here and there, but there is big projects that are happening or will be happening in the U.S., as example, in the next couple of months, where there's going to be five, 10, 15 AVs that will be circulating around. So the operator will do the maintenance of those vehicles, but will also overview the entire dispatch and the entire um, program itself. So it's the, yes, it's the maintenance of the vehicle, making sure it's charged every night, making sure that the, uh, the AC or the heating system works, uh, cleaning it, like just those kind of elements. So you still have the same maintenance need um, they're just on a, a really different level um, than the regular buses that you have. So I hope that answers the question. No, it's, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for that. I appreciate it. Um, so again, um, obviously every part of the ecosystem and, and roles that we define as it's right now need to be thought through. And I think Justin's asking a very similar question around that. And it's really around, um, you know, different jobs will have to be done differently, right? Because at the end of the day, we're ex we, we expect certain amount of performance and safety standards at this current moment. And there are certain policies and procedures that allow us to do that right now. And uh, I'm really coming in from a maintenance aspect, which is why my question was mainly around maintenance, but I think you, you addressed it. It still needs to be worked out. And there's a lot of unknowns in terms of how this would work because without an operator, looking at the performance and giving that feedback, it's going to be challenging as well to kind of yeah. say, when should that, you know, that rattle noise become actually a safety issue. Mm -hmm. And I think that on the operator side, nobody has the intent to remove the operator directly from the equation. So if it's not an operator on site in the vehicle, there's still going to be like a command cen center where you're going to have um, people watching what is happening in those vehicles on in real time. Um, and we talk about the low speed of time is vehicle, but I had a demonstration last week for drones and it's the same thing. So there's not going to be anyone in the drones to do the delivery that will be done, but there's going to be a command center where people will be sitting there and it's really uh, futuristic. It's like a, a big video game where you sit in there and you have like access to all those drones flying everywhere. Um, but this is really what is happening right now. But the, the, one of the, the most important points in what you said is that we're not trying to remove everyone from the chain of command, but we will definitely, we as a society, will need to repurpose some of the jobs that are um, more manual maybe right now, but will become technology manual, if I can say it that way, but in the future. So it's those kind of elements that we just need to address. And I think that at this point, um, it's all about understanding what is coming because it's not a if, it's a when. So if we want to put our hand in, head in sand and just say like, no, nope, it is not going to come to my city or no, nope, I'm an operator and I don't need to know about AV, fine, but the tsunami will hit you hard, <laughs> fortunately. So I'll, 
I'll continue because those are the questions that are addressed in the playbook that we had put together. So based on the six years of experience that uh, I worked on AV and the 12 years of um, Corey and all the other team member that we have. So we have a combination of like 50 years of experience in AV, which is huge since it started yesterday. So 50 years of experience in AV, we put that playbook together. And the idea is to have a kind of a, a big high level recipe but we put the flavor and the personalization to all of the projects that we're doing through that playbook. So the, I'll start there. So the overview uh, of what we are doing is really that there's six different steps when it comes down to doing an AV deployment. I'm gonna go through those six steps just to give you a, a really high level. I'm not gonna go through all the details. There's no quiz at the end, nothing, but just give you a high level point of what it is. But at the end, it's important to remember that it's not everyone that is at the same level. So you might have someone like Chris that is one, two, and he wants to stop after two. But you, you might have someone like Jeffrey that wants to go all the way to the end. So it's very important to make sure that we respect where the client is on AV readiness and that we can support them uh, on those different steps. So the getting starting, getting started, sorry, is really the, the phase to design what we want to do. We uh, have the first conversation with the clients and the idea is to focus on the end result and not how we want to do it. So it's very important. We go through those questions. We, we collect as many, as much data as possible because data is what we need. So that's the theme of that conference, but data is very, very important. And that's going to provide us uh, some really valid insight that will lead to recommendation on how we want to do it. The data is important for us, but it's also very important for the policymakers or the communities that will give their approval to do those kind of projects. And also super, super important to the people that will fund the project. They don't give money if they don't know what they're jumping into. So having that kind of data will really provide a strong backbone to the project and help us to move forward. Once we get started, we have a feasibility study. It's really to understand what you want to do and what are the objective of what you want to do. Like you're looking to do something in the air, on the ground, underwater, why not? The sky's the limit again. So let's dream about everything that we can do. And that's when we start doing the policy assessment and the safety assessment and really just um, work on the first base of the project itself to align with the, the strategy that uh, the client had at first. And we created the budget important. Acquisition, how do we want to work with the constructor of a solution? Do we want to buy it? Do we want to rent it? Um, are they willing to give it to us? Are they willing to say, hey, you can use it for three months at no cost? Um, Fortunately, sky's the limit here. <laughs> they don't really say that. But if you have new technology, um, new robots that are trying to get the proof of concept, that could be a really good idea. And um, if you are interested about the AV world, it's, uh, it's hard to track every day there's something new. So it's something that I'm really happy about because every day I learn about something. But it's, uh, it's a constant reimagination of the ecosystem. So acquisition, that's a part we support our clients with. The implementation is really the project on like, what are steps one, two, three, four to make it happen. So the, the, the route assessment, the programming of the vehicle, making sure that ITS is all inter, interconnected with the path that we're using, um, the approval from the policy, all the states, the legal, uh, municipal, everything is in there, but that's really the implementation thing. The operation is where the vehicle is going. So that's where we, we test it and we make sure to track it on a regular basis. So we don't just like start it and then leave it going for a couple of weeks, months, and then just say, oh, that didn't work at, on day two. It's very important to track it on a regular basis and make the adjustment as it goes to make sure that we're not burning the idea of an AV. But if you do a project that doesn't work, um, keep in mind that you're going to burn a lot of bridges and that it's going to have a big impact on the other evolution of AVs. 
So we're really cautious of that. <laughs> and then, oops, and then the monitor and evaluation of the program, making sure that we recap everything, provide uh, benchmark best practices, and what we need to avoid in the upcoming project. And that's it. I don't want to go into too much detail more than that because it's it's really just to provide a higher level kind of a step of what we can do to to support and what are important to consider when you do an AD deployment. But again, data is a starting point of these projects <laughs> and interest, obviously. <laughs> Thank you so much, Marie France. This has been an awesome talk. And thank you so much for being, you know, open and answering questions that came through in the chat. Uh, we can't say how much we appreciate your time and sharing with our community. It's a pleasure. I see that there's a question. Do we have time? Um, unfortunately, we're actually out of time. Uh, the next presentation will start in just a minute here. Um, but is there a way that folks can uh, can contact yeah. you? My email address is there. Everyone can reach out to me at any time. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, everyone. <laughs>